This is slide four of our World War II unit. Uh, the U.S. gears up for war, so let's get ready to get us in the fighting uh, now that Pearl Harbor has happened. But this is, remember, a world war, so who are we going to fight, where are we going to fight, all that has to be decided. And that is decided with the ABC-1 agreement. ABC-1. Uh, it's an acronym. It stands for America, Britain, and Canada. ABC. America, Britain, and Canada. Um, this was an agreement between the United States and Great Britain and Canada, Britain's largest colony here. Um, uh, an agreement to address Europe first, then the Pacific, with the thought that uh, even though Japan attacked us, Germany and Hitler are the bigger threat. So it's the get Germany first strategy. Um, now, we have a problem here at home. This is another one of those not-so-bright and shining moments in our history. And it involves uh, Executive Order 9066, signed by President Roosevelt. Executive Order 9066 establishes internment camps, or prison camps, concentration camps, right? um, for Japanese Americans. Following Pearl Harbor, there was a great fear that all the Japanese living on the west coast of the United States uh, were spies, and they were all going to sabotage uh, American military bases, they were all spies for Japan, even though there was absolutely zero evidence that any of that was true. Uh, the United States rounded up um, about a little over 110,000 people in the United States of Japanese heritage. Over 110,000 were rounded up and sent to internment camps, or prison camps. Uh, the United States built ten camps um, in seven different states, many of them in the Midwest and Western, mainly Western United States. Uh, I think Arkansas was as far east as they went. Everything was west of there. Um, but ten camps were built to house these 110,000 Japanese Americans. Two-thirds of them, Two-thirds of those that were locked up were what were called Nisei, N-I-S-E-I. -I. Yeah, you see on the screen there, Nisei. Right? These are American citizens born in the United States. They just happen to have Japanese heritage in them. But these are American citizens that are locked up in prison camps without a trial, without any evidence to support they'd done anything wrong. Um, they were um, under guard. These were prison camps. They had, you know, gun towers every couple hundred yards, um, barbed wire surrounding the, the camps. They were allowed to live together as families, um, but under constant guard. They were allowed to work. Every morning, trucks would come and pick up, specifically men, to go work on nearby farms. And at the end of the day, they were taken back. Um, but they lived under constant um, guard. Um, people locked up for having done absolutely nothing wrong. Uh, this is a, surely one of those not-so-bright and shining moments in our history. Um, the, uh, the Japanese internment camps. Now, we're going to have to fight the war, but to do that, we need materials. And that involves the War Production Board. Okay. Uh, this is a government agency set up to make sure that uh, the military had what it needed to fight the war. Um, they stopped the production of all non-essential items. Uh, they controlled raw materials. So if you didn't want to build what the government needed, your factory suddenly found itself without any materials to build anything. It's very similar to World War I. Um, but uh, we need things built. Okay. Uh, rationing was a big deal. Uh, people were only allowed to buy so much gas. People were only allowed to buy so much food. Um, 
because our allies needed a lot and we the military needed a lot. So rationing was a huge deal, uh, part of the War Production Board's effort to make sure that the military had what it needed. Now, they controlled sort of the factories and the owners. On the worker side of things, we had the NWLB. It stands for National War Labor Board. National War Labor Board. Uh, and they are working with the workers of the country. Um, the NWLD put a, a ceiling on wage increases, so nobody got raises anymore. We just couldn't afford it. Uh, unions resented being interfered with. Um, strikes started up all over the place. So one of the things that the NWLB does is pass the smith Connolly Anti-Strike Act. smith Connolly Anti-Strike Act. It made it illegal to go on strike, basically. Um, if you were an agency, a factory, an industry, uh, that built something that the war effort needed, it made it illegal to go on strike. And if your factory could not build what it was supposed to, this law gave the federal government the power to take over the factory. So if the factory wasn't building tanks or planes or guns or bullets or uniforms or parachutes or whatever it needed, if the factory wasn't building what was needed to be built, the government had the authority to come in and take over the factory. Um, and they did in two industries, coal and railroads. Coal was not being manned to run the factories. The railroads stopped running because of strikes. So the government said, fine. We'll run them. And the federal government took over the coal and railroad industries. Right. Now, um, we needed workers on the farms. A lot of farmers had gone off to fight in the war. Right. A lot of farmers. We need lots of workers. Uh, uh, so, where are we going to get them? We're going to import them. <laughs> uh, immigrants called brasieros. Brasieros. Right. These are Mexican agricultural workers. Immigrants brought in to the United States to work on the farms in the West. These are Mexican immigrants brought in uh, to work on the farms in the West. And this program will go on for over uh, 20 years, as you see up here in the top right-hand corner of your slide. Los Braceros, the Braceros program. Uh, farmers working in the West, Mexican immigrants. Uh, do a very good job. Raise lots of food. Uh, thanks to new technology, new fertilizers, record amounts of food has grown. Uh, thanks in large part to the braceros. Uh, and finally, we got to keep the, uh, the the factories running, and that will once again, as it did with World War One, involve the women. Rosie the Riveter and the iconic uh, poster here, "We Can Do It," represents the women working in the factories. Okay. Um, Rosie the Riveter was a fictional character, but this is her on the poster. Uh, first of all, what's a riveter? Well, what's a rivet? Uh, a rivet is like a, it's a special type of bolt uh, that holds together sheets of metal. So when you think about uh, a ship or a plane or a tank where the seam is, where two pieces of steel or metal come together, it has that line of dots those are bolts. Those are rivets. Right? And you put them in with an air pressure gun, an air gun, a rivet gun. Um, so a riveter is someone who puts together sheets of metal. Right? Um, so Rosie the Riveter represented the women working in the factories. Right? More than six million women took up work outside the home during the war. Many of them in the factories. Six million women get jobs uh, during the war to keep the country running. Um, and how did they do it? When they had children, the government stepped in and they said, okay, women, if you'll come and work in the factories, we will help take care of your children. The government built 3,000 daycare centers around the country, many of them in factories. So if the women are going to do their part, the government um, is too. Uh, 